Okay. We are live now. And I'm very happy to welcome Melody Yasha uh, to our first lecture in the module. Does it work? Yes, it works. Uh, good evening, US. Uh, no, good evening, uh, Europe. Good evening, UAE, and good morning, USA. That's it. Uh, welcome to the first talk of this term's module, Emerging Fields in Architecture. It is organized by the Department of Building Construction and Design, Hochbar 2, at the TU Wien. And the aim of the module, Emerging Fields in Architecture, is to deal with current and future design challenges in a broader social, technical, and interdisciplinary context. So all the talks in these modules will impart knowledge from new research fields in architectural and engineering disciplines, questioning strategies for design in an interdisciplinary course. Our first talk will be uh, conducted by Melody Yesha. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Melody is a fellow member of the Space Architecture Technical Committee at the AIAA and a design architect, technologist, and researcher. She is the head of building design and performance at ICON, a startup pioneering the future of 3D printed housing for Earth and space. Melody is also professor at Art Center College of Design and has been a senior researcher in human factors at NASA Ames via the San Jose State University Research Foundation. She is also a co-founder of the SEARCH group, that is Space Exploration Architecture. Her background is in industrial design, architecture, and human-computer interaction, with a strong emphasis in robotics. Thank you, Melody, for joining our module this semester, and we are looking forward to hearing more about your work and especially the Project Olympus. The floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that wonderful introduction. It's wonderful to be here. Um, thank you for having me. So I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen and we can speak a little bit together about Project Olympus. I'll aim for roughly 40 minutes, if that's good, if that makes sense. Uh, we have quite a bit of time. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. And you'll hear a little bit about my uh, background and how I came to be working on this project and subsequently with ICON afterwards. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. 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 Fantastic. Thank you for confirming. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about, actually, I'm going to tell you a lot about a certain emphasis within Project Olympus, which is ICON's plan to develop a single construction system for additive manufacturing on the lunar surface. Um, the contents of my presentation is I'm going to tell you first about IMPACT, which is the NASA program that Project Olympus sits within, sits under, um, and is supported by and funded by. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Olympus itself from ICON's perspective. Uh, and then a specific scope of work that was developed for Search Plus uh, to develop essentially initial schematic plans for a lunar base. So as part of that project, I'm going to tell you about how we approach site planning and site and base planning, the methodologies that were involved in that. Um, a habitat ideation and constructability, as well as landing pad ideation. So for a little bit of background in me, as Sandra said, I was a co-founder of Search Plus. Uh, we competed in multiple levels of the NASA Centennial Challenge for a 3D printed habitat. And uh, subsequently we had been involved in many, a, a few consulting projects in industry. Uh, I resigned from Search Plus at the conclusion of the Olympus project, and then I was asked to join ICON internally shortly afterwards. So the work that I'm going to be representing here today, some of it is representative of the ongoing 
hardware and robotics development that ICON is currently working on, but the bulk of it was done as a collaborative group while I was a part of Search Plus, um, as well as with other collaborators for that scope of work specifically defined to come up with design, uh, the design for a lunar base. So Project Olympus, as I said, is part of a NASA program called IMPACT, which stands for the Moon to Mars Planetary Autonomous Construction Technologies uh, Program. The PI, the principal investigator of this project is Dr. Raymond Clinton, and it's supported by Mike Fisk, as well as Gen Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Edmondson at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. And the goal of IMPACT, forgive me for reading, but it happens to be just the easiest way to get the point across right now, is to develop, deliver, and demonstrate on-demand capabilities to protect astronauts and create infrastructure on the lunar surface via the construction, construction of landing pads, habitats, shelters, roads, berms, and blast shields using, using lunar regolith based materials. There we have a specific bias to use only in situ regolith for the purposes of additive construction, meaning we're not looking at uh, and we're not looking in large part on uh, additives and binders for, as feedstock. Uh, Impact is composed of three interrelated elements, Olympus, which is ICON's scope of work, auton the autonomous construction system, uh, as well as two other elements, construction feedstock materials development, which is led by Dr. Jennifer Edmondson, as well as my my microwave structure construction capabilities, which is led by uh, Dr. Mike Effinger. And, uh, Overall, this is the kind of, I guess you could say, organization of the impact group. NASA has uh, assembled a really impressive group from academia, research, and industry to collaborate on this project. ICON is the prime contractor for the Olympus work. And over the course of roughly a six month period for uh, when, when the schematics for the lunar base were developed, ICON employed both Search Plus as well as BIG, the Bjarke Ingels Group, to develop concepts for master planning as well as habitat concepts that would be relevant for a lunar base. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm going to be representing some of the search work and some of the big work, and uh, but with a specific focus on what I was directly involved in. So surface construction. There are two types of infrastructure elements to be constructed by the Olympus system, horizontal construction as well as vertical construction. And those would happen subsequently, right? We would start with horizontal construction to cover planar surfaces such as rocket landing pads, foundations and roads. And then we would move towards vertical construction capabilities to create unpressurized structures, habitats and uh, other kinds of radiation shielding. Uh, for the purposes of the impact project, in large part, the ideas that were introduced by Search Plus were primary, were uh, foundational and and formative for the thinking of how to move forward for horizontal construction, and the ideas of the Arca Ingalls Group were foundational and formative for the ideas in forming vertical construction as well as habitat design. But because the project, because we, it was such a, for the sake of being comprehensive to the project, I'm going to cover some of the habitat ideas that were introduced by search as well. Um, some of the high level capability gaps from impact include uh, that have also been uh, identified by the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium include uh, capabilities such as deposition processes and associated materials, increased autonomy of operations, hardware operation and manufacturing under lunar environmental conditions, long duration operation of mechanisms and parts, scale of construction activities and material and construction requirements and standards. This is in large part what ICON is developing now. Uh, this is a roadmap that IMPACT has put together for lunar excavation, construction and outfitting. And the important point to note here is that in large part, ICON has been uh, instrumental in inspiring the ideas in, in establishing uh, the thinking that would uh, 
that it has really become formative to how we think about hardware development and requirements for additive manufacturing on the surface of the moon. Okay, so Project Olympus. Here you'll see a schematic for a master plan that was developed by Bjarke Ingels group. As I mentioned, both Big and Search developed schematic plans for lunar bases. Here is an aerial view of the concept that was put together by Big. This was a horizontal, they introduced a horizontal structure, uh, a single story horizontally oriented structure in a torus shape, the search project in an interesting kind of shift of perspective was a vertically oriented structure with multiple levels. And uh, here's some of the landing pad development that I'm going to be speaking about in just a little bit. It's important to note that this was a highly collaborative project. Sandra asked me to speak about this project following a presentation that I gave and a paper that was delivered for the International Conference in Environmental Systems, ISIS, this year. Uh, and it represents the work that was done by Search Plus, as well as multiple collaborators that have been uh, that we assembled for the sake of putting this project together and, and delivering these ideas. So the Search Plus associates included myself, uh, Michael Morris, Rebecca Pilas Friedman, and the collaborators included Walid El Shanshuri, Masa Esfandabaji, David Gomez, Alexander Guziv, Karen Kuo. Vittorio Netti, Albert Rajkumar, and Christian Saif. Okay, so to go into some of the foundational ideas for how we sort of conceived of planning and designing for a lunar vase, uh, these four points, programmatic principles affecting performance, safety, and cost effectiveness were adopted from Brent Schroward and Larry, and Larry Troop's uh, essay on design constraints for planet surface architecture, and they are adaptability, which is accommodating off nominal conditions, flexibility, adapting to changing requirements, resilience, which is accommodating failure, multi-use, which is the principle of commonality, or using the same product line for more than one application, and reuse, using the same hardware more than once. What we did in our initial kind of research phase was we looked at top surface construction tasks. These were specifically uh, elements that were put together within a, 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 I guess you could say a workshop that was hosted at the Keck Center in 2017 by multiple individuals, including many of those involved within the impact project. And overwhelmingly what we discovered was that Plan that regolith based construction elements composed of the, the majority of infrastructure that is going to be required for a sustainable presence and a permanent presence on the moon. And those involve elements of planar surface construction, unpressurized shielding, as well as habitats and utility shelters. So this is a rough categorization of each of the elements that are going to be essential for permanent lunar infrastructure. Uh, and the idea here that it was that I find so striking is that because the majority of these elements can be constructed using in situ regolith, we are biased towards introducing a single construction system that can account for all of them. This would be extremely effective, extremely efficient, and a big success for the for the sake of our project. So the product tree for Olympus com uh, com is composed of a material deposition system, a mobility platform for that deposition system, a transportation system, command and control software, and uh, we would need access to power, of course, as well. So it's worth mentioning that it, it, the Olympus construction system will need to integrate with other elements such as ISRU materials handling, excavation, which largely remains out of the scope of additive construction for the project, power resources, and it will enable the construction, as I've said before, of habitats, permanent infrastructure elements, as well as uh, horizontal structures such as roadways and landing pads. So, uh, this is a, a, a kind of concept chart that was inspired by some of the work done by Jerry Sanders um, on ISRU, and this is essentially showing how these elements, uh, the dependencies of these elements, including power and excavation capabilities, and how essential they're going to be for surface construction with the Olympus system. 
Uh, here we have a regolith construction development timeline, which is mapping out the phases that will lead towards the creation of a permanent lunar base as well as strategic expansion of that, of that base and how they map towards, map with regolith construction milestones that are going to, that are going to have to be achieved if we want to create uh, robust, durable, pressurized structures using only in situ regolith. And so some of the present constraints that we're working with include having to, uh, having to struggle with not being able to print less than 30 degrees at a tangent overhang angle from a single deposited 3D printed uh, layer, uh, pressurization of 3D printed regolith structures and how we can introduce a material line or a seal for pressurization. And then concurrently to that, we're well aware that there are other types of surface structures, such as class one and class two surface structures, hard shells and inflatables and other deployables, which will likely deploy on the surface of the moon prior to in situ and ISRU regolith based surface construction habitats. So the idea here though, is not to ignore the fact that they will be there, but to integrate with those structures as best as possible and introduce additional radiation shielding possibilities for how we can uh, ensure the longevity of those other space architecture types. And then think ahead to how and, and really leverage the, the full capabilities of ISRU 3D printed construction to introduce sustainable and strategic expansion of that lunar settlement. Okay. Mission objectives and tasks. We know that we're going to be starting off on the surface of the moon with short stay missions that will include limited geological science and research. And over time as infrastructure and uh, I guess you could say permanent kind of resources on the moon expand, it will enable longer stay missions and more robust geological science and research as well as biological science and ISRU activities. We need to be thinking ahead to what mission objectives are actually going to be so that we can design functional programming for the crew as they're there on the surface of the moon and introduce the kind of, uh, I guess you could say, introduce the kind of systems and, and program elements that are going to be relevant to the specific mission at hand. Uh, phase development. So we will start with preliminary infrastructure, infra infrastructural development that would be representative of those short stay missions. In large part, they would be robotic precursor missions. And then in phases afterwards, as infrastructure expands on the moon, uh, we would enable that would enable expansion of elements such as uh, habitats, fuel storage, uh, and, and greenhouse development, to name a few kinds of ideas. So this is a step-by-step -step kind of sequence that was developed by the Bjarke Ingels group representing the expansion of that lunar base and the expansion of, uh, uh, I guess you could say, a master planning methodology to show how we would start with an initial kind of settlement and expand over time uh, given more uh, permanent infrastructure on the moon into a, more, into a fully fledged settlement. So first we would build roads and unpressurized shelters to protect machinery from radiation, micrometeorites and lunar dust. Uh, we would need to set up power resources such as nuclear uh, and solar. Um, and then Big took a look here at how to establish landing pads, roadways, and blast walls uh, within an organization that, um, so, such as you see here. And uh, then they sort of proposed ISRU infrastructure to be developed, uh, and then a habitat that was only built once that infrastructure was already there, including landing pads. Um, and then that would lead to expansion of that habitat within a cluster. And then future clusters of habitats would then actually be created subsequent to that. So you'll see the landing pads are quite a distance away from the habitats. This was one element that was uh, shared and sort of linked uh, between the two groups throughout the project. So here's another view of that uh, master planning approach that they had taken. Uh, the methodology for some of the site analysis and preparation that the Search Plus group 
came up with started with baseline principles or establishing baseline principles for master planning, which includes safety, efficiency, performance. Uh, that led to research and validation, uh, looking at some site data and potential landing sites and how we might be able to build in relation to those landing sites. Historical precedents, including RLSO, as well as McMurdo and Antarctica. Uh, operations and safety requirements, so identifying the critical infrastructure, identifying mission critical task operations and activities and functions, and then zoning and expansion requirements. So how can we introduce requirements for this phase development timeline that we know is going to exist? How can we introduce safety or keep out, keep out zones, program adjacencies or minimum and maximal travel distances? And use all of these elements as constraints to actually uh, generate and derive potential solutions for master planning. Some of the precedent projects that we took a look at included projects as early as Project Horizon from 1959 up until uh, RLS01 and RLS02, as well as the SOM project that was completed with ESA. Uh, we looked at many elements of uh, some of, and strategies and kind of, I guess you could say, design methodologies for some of these projects, how they introduced solutions for uh, operations, how they introduced solutions for construction sequencing. And uh, we derived some initial base components such as you see here and uh, that we felt were essential for incorporating within the master plan. So these are some other examples of precedents that we took a look at, really outstanding work on their part, different kind of approaches taken. And uh, we took a look at, you know, really, we, we really investigated like, what are the differences and what are the way, what are the different ways that these projects are addressing, again, uh, incorporating different types of habitat classes? Uh, what, is, what is their construction sequencing proposal, their planning proposal? Um, and then what are the equipment and assets that each project are, is introducing? Uh, McMurdo was an interesting case study for us in that we, the master plan and the original design intent from an urban kind of planning perspective was that the, the station would follow a linear trajectory kind of like along a spine. Uh, but the reality is that the planning ended up happening much more organically and followed the topography of the land. This was an interesting finding um, on our part. So to looking at the kind of intrinsic features of the land and the topography at the south pole of the moon, which is where the Artemis missions are projecting to have their first landing site. Uh, we took a look at the lunar reconnaissance orbiter maps to establish what are preferred areas in terms of illuminance at the south pole, topography, meaning we had a preference for flat sites, as well as a lower kind of temperature differentials at the south pole. Uh, using that site analysis, we also merged some of our thinking with some of the proposed sites that were introduced by RLSO2, which was a project led by JPL. Uh, and we merged our thinking with theirs, not wanting to sort of ignore the fact that there was a substantial amount of thought that went into how to establish uh, landing sites that can be instrumental for ISRU propellant projection. So this was our thinking and how we sort of merged our preferences in terms of adjacencies of program elements with some of the thinking that had already been developed by RLSO2. Uh, our, the criteria that we developed following our analysis of the lunar reconnaissance orbiter maps was that we wanted to identify sites that were highly illuminated that had relatively flat uh, topography, relatively with, with low slopes, uh, and then low temperature deviations as well. Secondary criteria included access to craters, future expansion so that we could introduce additional infrastructure, uh, excavation sites for ISRU and uh, for, for ISRU activities. And then the third criteria, like a third order criteria was how to develop roads that could follow contours and the roads that could be per perpendicular to topography contours. Uh, so here were some of the ideas that we introduced. I'm not going to go into them too much based off of these planning principles. And again, it was really just the introduction of a methodology that mattered most here. 
based off of this work, we sort of we developed a kind of infrastructure and zoning um, planning man manual. So you'll see here that we use that that knowledge to establish types of elements that we would need, types of infrastructure that we would need, requirements that they would need from a kind of, uh, I guess you could say topography or, or site planning perspective, distance considerations, keep out zones, um, and this became our kind of comprehensive planning mod, uh, manual. Okay, to shift to thinking more specifically about habitats. Uh, habitat resilience was a primary kind of component and value within our project, and it may be one of the most important concepts relative to the development of lunar infrastructure and, and integrated technologies. Um, there is quite a bit of work that is being done in, by Purdue and the Rethi Institute to sort of look at resilient systems for habitat construction, as well as the incorporation of cyber physical systems. And this work was also pretty instrumental in how I think about how we can introduce risk mitigation strategies having to do with resilient uh, habitat construction systems. So some of the risks that we do need to mitigate against, this may be familiar to many of you, um, these have to do with radiation shielding, so protecting against galactic cosmic ray solar particle events, seismic activity, so deep moon quakes lasting hours and even days, uh, as well as secondary effects having to do with meteor impacts on the surface of the moon. Uh, the meteoroid impacts themselves uh, that would require robust and durable shielding. Uh, and then how to mitigate against extreme temperature differentials, which introduce material stresses as well as structural and material fatigue. So architectural design strategies for risk mitigation, this is a short list of how we can sort of introduce new opportunities to mitigate against these environmental factors and risks. So for radiation, of course, we would introduce additional shielding mass to attenuate radiation dosage. We could introduce hydrogen rich materials, which are the highest performing in terms of uh, chemical composition to actually attenuate against radiation. Uh, we can introduce crew operational parameters, which in some ways are just as important as introducing, as introducing additional mass to attenuate against radiation. Uh, for seismic activity, some potential ideas that we brainstormed included base dampening and isolation, which actually became a concept that we introduced in our structural design, uh, additional structural reinforcement, High yield and elastic materials can be introduced to mitigate against temperature differential material, uh, extreme temperature differentials, heat transfer strategies, expansion joints within the structure itself. And then for meteoroid impacts, introducing uh, risk, risk mitigation tactics for ballistic robustness and dur durability, which would also be part of structural design, uh, structural reinforcement, Whipple shields, which I'll talk about shortly, as well as structural monitoring of the actual habitat itself using sensor networks and probabilistic risk assessments. Okay. New failure modes are going to need to be anticipated for the life cycle of lunar ISRU structures. There are very few types of pressurized structures that have been subject to or analyzed uh, according to the risk profiles that we are going to we are going to need to anticipate on the surface of the moon. So this is the really critical element of the work. The risks involved in depressurization can result from perforation within the material system, deterioration, uh, and of course, like a primary or secondary impact to the structure itself can absolutely lead to catastrophic failures that we want to mitigate against. So these are some of the challenges of introducing resilient surface infrastructure on the moon. Um, different types, I guess you could say classes of space architecture typologies are going to be better in my opinion, are better suited and worse suited towards mitigating against these risks. So here we did a, a kind of loose subjective sort of qualifying uh, sort of ranking of ballistic robustness, repairability, scalability, as well as radiation shielding potential for these three class one, class two, and so-called class three types of space architecture. Uh, passive shielding with regoliths. So this is the plots that you see on this on this page. 
uh, were developed by Daniel Case, who's a researcher at CU Boulder, and he specializes in particular on radiation shielding and attenuation of surface habitats. The point here, and this has been uh, written about and celebrated by multiple researchers, um, including Tony Slava, is that there's actually a point at which radiation dosage gets worse up to a certain thickness of and a certain density of lunar regolith uh, due to secondary particle effects that become trapped within the structure itself. So the real point here and the real opportunity that I see here is that we can leverage that fact to actually optimize the thickness of our, of our structural shell, the thickness of a potential habitat, so that we're we're introducing structures that are more efficient, more time effective to construct, and that introduce just the right amount of, uh, of, of protection for galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events. There's not yet a way to sort of calculate um, or, or to do radiation shielding analysis and ray tracing for both solar particle events as well as GCRs within the same simulation. So here we only have data relative to GCRs in interplanetary space. The Search Plus group did quite a bit of ideation relative to how we can introduce radiation shielding as a sort of uh, stepping stone to full-scale pressurized construction of surface structures. So here you see we were investigating hard shell and regolith construction and how we can introduce an unpressurized shield uh, as a first step towards a uh, fully pressurized kind of habitat construction later down the line. So here you'll see that we introduce the hard shell within the unpressurized uh, radiation shield, uh, excuse me, the infl an inflatable module within an unpressurized radiation shield. And here a hard shell, uh, pressurized surface, uh, surface habitat that is enclosed by an unpressurized uh, regolith based radiation shield. And uh, you'll notice that these kind of bucket holders on the outside of the, of the surface are actually intended to, to sort of cup and hold loose regolith that could be deposited subsequently so that we're optimizing the use of our power for the construction of uh, a minimal kind of radiation uh, shield and canopy for the pressurized structures. So this is some additional ideation that we did uh, again, looking at how we can incorporate elements of class one and class two architecture uh, with what will in the future be pressurized class three, uh, 3D printed construction. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the final kind of habitat concept that was put together for the Olympus scope of work done by Search Plus. Uh, we referred to this concept as the lunar lantern for its illuminated feature that we theorized the illuminated kind of uh, uh, the illuminated quality that we theorized could be achievable through the introduction of a Whipple shield on the ex on the outside of the habitat. Uh, the form itself was generated through primarily through the constraint of not being able or at least for the time being, not being able to print a tangent overhang angle uh, greater than 20 degrees. So here we validated that the actual pressure vessel and geometry of the structure itself would not introduce those tangent overhangs that are not capable of being constructed currently due to uh, insufficient interlayer adhesion, at least with regolith-based processes. Here's a section of the habitat showing how we introduce a secondary shield to the outside of the pressurized membrane. Uh, we introduce tension cables as well as a deployable top cap, which uh, served as a kind of capstone to the pressurized interior of the habitat. And I'll walk through some of the, the interior and program elements of the habitat in just a little bit. There are three structural technologies that we use to mitigate against performance objectives for the habitat. They are base isolation, post-tensioning, as well as the Whipple shield. Uh, for base isolation, we introduce friction pendulums that are brought from Earth and placed uh, above the foundation. For post-tensioning, we introduced uh, 
tension cables that would be deployed from the top cap of the habitat. And the performance objective of those would be crack prevention as opposed to material reinforcement. Uh, and then the Whipple shield, we theorized that this would become a critical element to act as a thermal barrier for the, for the, for the pressurized part of the habitat itself. Uh, and we did do quite a bit of finite element analysis, which I haven't included here to actually validate that that would, at, would which is intuitive, right? To validate that it actually would um, be a mitigating factor. Uh, the Wibble Shield also, also introduces potential to repair and maintain the system. And uh, there's lots of existing precedent aboard the ISS. So it's a high TRL uh, technology as it is right now. So here's the composite wall section for the habitat. You'll see on the interior, we introduced a fabric and material liner, and then we have a continuously sintered regolith shell, tension cables brought from earth, of course, the Whipple shield lattice, as well as discrete Whipple shield panels, which would be manufactured um, and then installed on the exterior of the shield structure, the lattice structure. Performance objectives of the habitat, it must remain operational and pressurized. It must be resilient to cyclic loading and fatigue. It must maintain an internal pressure of one atmosphere and avoid crack formations under low, low stress limit states. And then for the shield structure itself, some repairable damage is acceptable, knowing that you know, there is the risk of micrometeorites hitting the structure. It must be resilient to cyclic loading and fatigue caused by long duration seismic events. It must be resilient to asymmetrical thermal loading and must be resilient to micrometeor impact. Okay, and now to speak a little bit about the programming of the interior of the habitat. Uh, to actually derive what we need in terms of hardware, consumables, and equus requirements, and sizing for the habitat overall, we also must be thinking about the crew size, the mission duration, as well as the mission activities. Some of these were known to us prior to the project. We knew we would be designing for a crew of four in alignment with the Artemis missions that are planned within the next decade. But things like mission, mission duration as well as activities remain, remained unknown. So it became, it was up to us to really set those parameters for our work. Based off of that, we came up with baseline habitation requirements for a habitat module. Uh, we did not design for a logistics module that remained out of the scope of the project. And similarly, we did not design for a laboratory or working module um, that was out of, outside of the scope of, our, of, of the design for the time being. And then to recall some of the prior uh, kind of ideas that I introduced having to do with infrastructure as well as master planning, we knew that there would be other uh, resources available on the surface of the moon, including possibly other pressurized working spaces, a greenhouse, um, and then of course, landing facilities and power facilities. So here was a kind of rough sort of schematic approach that we took to how we might size the habitat module in comparison with the logistics module as well as the laboratory module. Um, and again, it's worth mentioning that for the next few slides, we're, I'm only focusing on the habitat module we did not design for logistics or for laboratory space. So on the first level of the habitat, we introduced a medical station, lounge, restroom, as well as crew quarters. And here is a view of the crew quarters from the first floor of the habitat. Second level of the, of the habitat, we introduced mission control, a gym, uh, restroom, as well as the a space for ECLIS hardware, which is environmental control and life support systems hardware. And here's a view of that space. And then on the third level of the habitat, we introduced a galley storage uh, and general recreation area where the crew could spend their leisure time. Here's a view of uh, the habitat concept in construction by the Olympus system. Uh, and then to briefly go over construction sequencing for the habitat, this is an important element of 3D printed construction overall and something that really 
distinguishes how we have to think about integrating other elements with 3D printed construction, uh, both terrestrially and in space. So we start with excavation and then we would print the foundation. We would need to place, we introduced a free integrated mechanical core uh, that would be placed subsequent to the foundation being printed. And then the pressure vessel would be printed, the tension cables would be deployed and then the lattice and the Whipple shield would be the last thing to actually be constructed. So again, we start with excavation, the 3D printed foundation, the placement of the pre-integrated core, uh, and then the core itself was sized according to the SLS block two, the, the fairing of the SLS block two. Uh, the pressure vessel would then be printed. The uh, It would continue to to uh, be printed until the pre-integrated core telescopes upwards. Tension cables would be deployed from the top of the, uh, of the pressurized core, uh, the, from the top of the pre-integrated mechanical core. And then finally, a Himawari, which is a, a lighting device would be installed at the very top. Uh, the Whipple shield would then be the last thing to be constructed starting with the lattice structure as well as uh, the shield panels afterwards, and then airlocks and pressurization would follow. So to shift gears, to speak about landing pads, uh, that was our habitat concept referred to as the lunar lantern. Uh, the landing pad development work that, the landing pad work that uh, was put together for this project became instrumental for some of the prototyping and ideation that ICON is engaging in currently and is ongoing. Uh, so to go over some basic components of landing pad design, we start with uh, the central pad. And in our case, we found it essential to distinguish that the central pad and the material composition and, and structure, structural performance of the central pad does not necessarily need to be exactly the same as what is within an external ring. It, it can actually, we can actually optimize uh, the performance capabilities of the central pad and the innermost area of the landing pad to uh, withstand the heat and pressure uh, requirements of a lander. And that doesn't necessarily need to be replicated within an external ring. Uh, other additional, uh, other components that are just as critical for landing pad development include a blast wall as well as a dust trench. And I'll speak about those in just a second. Sizing of a landing pad is probably the most critical kind of decision that needs to be made in regards to what sort of landers and, landers and landing accuracies we can anticipate on the surface of the moon. Of course, with greater landing accuracy, we probably would not need as large of a a landing pad and we can optimize again the time and the and materials that would be required for constructing such a massive structure. Um, but overall, uh, I would say that this is highly dependent on the landing system itself. Um, so to skip ahead, oh no, to skip ahead, we took a look at what a landing pad might be in terms of in terms of how it could accommodate the blue moon lander, the starship, as well as the Dianetics human landing system. And although we didn't do much in terms of validating these approaches, uh, it did give us a sense of the general scale of these landing systems and how we would need to be able to accommodate for the dust plume effects that would result. Okay, shifting, shifting forward. So in terms of the external ring and internal ring of the landing pad, we, we brainstormed that there could be different sort of construction mechanisms for, for making each. Uh, the center, we, we investigated a tile-based approach such has been explored and prototyped within Pisces in Hawaii by NASA and other groups. Um, and the real benefit of a tile-based or paver-based approach is that it does introduce repairability so that if you have a paver or two or a portion of the pad that has been uh, destroyed or that has been irreparably damaged, you can go ahead and replace that section without having to reconstruct an entire portion of the landing pad. And then outside of that central, a central area could be loose gravel, which could be 3D printed, for example. And then of course, other alternatives would be to incorporate continuously printed uh, structure, horizontal structure, 
uh, as well as pavers on the outside with continuously printed structure on the inside. We did not, again, go so far as to validate what would be a minimum thickness for the landing pad, which I think is one of the central ideas like that we need to validate in research, but it is something that we are uh, investigating internally at IPON currently. So how to mitigate against plume effects? The risk of uh, plume effects are, are, cannot be underestimated when it comes to, to how we think about sustainable construction of landing pads uh, as infrastructure on the moon. Um, dust particles can, that are uh, supersonic can even go into orbit around the moon uh, following, uh, following landing events. Uh, so that's something that we really need to mitigate against. Uh, some research that we took a look at indicated that faster particles, supersonic particles eject at lower angles um, and then slower particles eject at higher angles. So up to 17 degrees from the central landing, uh, for, from, from the landing, uh, I guess you say event. Um, and so this, we use this as a sort of starting point for our ideation and how we can introduce strategies to mitigate against plume effects. Um, and here you'll see this was a concept image that we put together showing the various landing systems as well as the Olympus system coming down on a blue moon lander and uh, landing on the surface of the moon. Uh, some of the more, I guess you could say, explorative concepts that we put together had to do with strategizing for absorption of dust plume effects, uh, deviation, as well as accumulation within dust trenches. And again, these, these are really just explorative ideas for how we can introduce a more robust functionality within a landing pad, a potential landing pad. So these are some of the floor plans, I guess, these are some of the plans that we came up with uh, that explore these concepts of uh, absorption and uh, deviation and accumulation. Some additional ideas here. This was one concept that we introduced uh, and you'll notice that there are three kind of access points to the pad. Access points to unload cargo is a huge, huge element of consideration that we have to be thinking about in the future. Uh, we referred to this as the sunflower vault because the actual blast shields were sort of vaulting inwards and introduced um, a really kind of interesting and beautiful way of mitigating against dust plume effects. And uh, we, we introduced a dust trench that could be uh, that could be used for sort of collecting and cleaning the site following uh, landings over the course of um, several years. So uh, here's the sunflower vault as it was referred to in rendering and a view of the sunflower vaults with uh, various landing systems coming that, as it would be used by various landing systems. Uh, here's a view of the Olympus construction system actually creating the landing, the blast walls itself. And I'll conclude by talking about an initial demonstration that we recently completed. Actually, it's not so recent that we completed in March um, in collaboration with a lunar pad team. So uh, the lunar pad team was a student group that was assembled by uh, that was assembled via NASA Marshall and the impact program. And they came up with a lunar pad design such as you see here that introduced these internal channels to actually uh, vent out dust plume. And uh, it was an interesting sort of demonstration. We printed the structure at Camp Swift and then we were able to actually do a hot fire test, which was pretty exciting. Um, Here's a view of us printing the landing pad itself using the Vulcan, our Vulcan printer and the hot fire test that we completed. This was a subscale demo, of course, but it represents some of the future prototyping that we'll be engaging in to um, actually uh, bring these ideas into fruition and to, and to increase the technology readiness level of the deposition mechanisms that we introduce for landing pads, as well as the structural design of the pads themselves. 
Um, in this case, we were printing with our proprietary based lava crete material. Um, this is not necessarily representative of the materials that we would find on the lunar surface, but again, it does uh, represent just an initial demonstration for how we might approach these sorts of experiments in the future and and as we're and 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 how we're approaching uh, I guess you could say structural design and validation of our landing pads moving forward. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for your attention. Melody, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, high speed, intensive, super interesting presentation. We have already a lot of questions. And I would like to start with the students' question. Um, I have also a lot of questions myself, but I let the students first ask the question. What was the what was the first question? Should I open the chat? What would be? The oh, no, no, I'm I'm reading it. Or, okay, um, trübselige Ananas. Please ask your question first. You were the first one. Uh, yeah. Hello, I wanted to ask um, about the 3D printing because uh, when I think about uh, a radial construction, what first comes to mind is that the printer would be in the center and then just turning around. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, when I saw the, the videos, I thought yeah, it makes sense to, to have it outside because you're building a wall around yourself. And then, Oh, it's a really good point. There's, there are different form factors when it comes to, oh, if we're talking about like a single printer, right, as opposed to multiple printers, swarm robotics, and like small kind of mini builders that would actually be working collaboratively to 3D print, there are multiple form factors that are very appealing in terrestrial construction and in the future for lunar construction. And you're right that there are competitors to ICON that do incorporate a kind of radial approach to 3D printing. I've worked with one of them in the past, but ICON's approach, and this is specifically because we're interested in scaling our, our system so that we can introduce housing at scale in a kind of production line capability. Uh, we work with a gantry based system and that sort of determines the size and the and the minimum, or I shouldn't say minimum, the maximum width of the, of the structures that we create. And it enables us to actually print on rails. And the printer is literally on rails in a linear fashion. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but it, it does enable a kind of assembly line approach, which aligns very well with the scalability that we're interested in for, for mass housing. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Next question from Miriam. Miriam Sengspratl had a question. Is part of the furniture also included in the vessel printing? Furniture is not included in the vessel printing, no. It would need to, in, at least in this, in this project, they would need to be brought from Earth. There's some pretty nice furniture in there. OK, <laughs> thanks. Uh, next question from Marlene. Um, yeah, hi. I just wanted to ask, maybe I missed it, and you already uh, told us, but what kind of material are you using for 3D printing, and how does it get to the moon? <laughs> and, yeah. Great, great question. Foundational question to all of this work. The idea is that we would be using the local and indigenous regolith, the lunar soil uh, that would be there. And we're, even though there might be some processing required of that regolith to remove volatiles and, and things like that, the basic idea is that we want to use what's there. We don't want to bring binders and additives from Earth. We just want to basically collect the lunar soil, the regolith, and use it as feedstock for 3D printing. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Uh, next question from Philip. 
Halvax. Um, yeah. Um, my question was, uh, since the concept of the lunar lantern is more or less based on the shielding properties of the lunar regolith, um, does this concept also work in a Martian context? Like, um, is the Martian soil or regolith, um, does it have similar properties or would this, this concept not even work on Mars? Oh, that's an interesting question. I never really thought about it that way. I, I, yeah, in effectively, there's no reason why it wouldn't work on Mars because it does introduce a kind of redundant shielding mechanism to the pressurized chair, to, to the pressurized shell on the inside. So, so yeah, in, I don't think necessarily that we would use the same 3D printing deposition strategies for the Mars that we would use on the moon. Um, for the moon, we're looking primarily at heat-based strategies for Mars. We could even look at into look into like cement-based approaches that incorporate water, for example, just because the conditions are so different. But in terms of structure, yes, I agree with you. I think that the, the Whipple shield as a concept could be incorporated in an environment such as Mars, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Uh, next question by Flora. Um, I've got the question about the wibbles. So I understood so first you have this regular uh, shield or shell and on top these wibbles and underneath there's this light and these wibbles, they spread the light. And so you have this kind of lantern effect. Um, do these wibbles also have like protective uh, functions or like other functions? <laughs> yeah, so the idea of the Whipple shield, they're, basically there are these panels that are installed on the outside of the International Space Station and they're not made, they're, they're, it's really analogous in terms of like, what is the strategy, but the Whipple shields that are aboard the International Space Station are specifically uh, made out of like multiple material layups. So metal as well as uh, fabric like Kevlar and whatnot. Um, and, and the idea there is that it's intended to protect the station where it needs it most and where it's most vulnerable to, to, to impacts. Uh, the concept for the, for the Lunar Lantern Whipple Shield is that we introduced it as a secondary kind of strategy to protect against micrometeorites and other kind of uh, impacts that could potentially depressurize the structure. So it's like we took the concept from the ISS, which is already a, a highly developed technology that's aboard space station right now. And we used it as a kind of, uh, as a kind of jumping off point for how we can develop that concept using regolith and for regolith con uh, construction. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Next question is from Marcel Hecker. Hi. Uh, my question is a more general one. Um, how do you see the idea of colonizing the moon in regards of the environmental crisis that we are in on Earth, since uh, space traveling takes a lot of energy and money? It does take a lot of energy and money. I agree with you. And it's, I mean, there's so much I could say about this question. It's almost hard to know where to start. I think that the overall, it's very difficult to sort of think about space exploration competitively with the other technologies, strategies, environmental and climate-based approaches that we need to heal and to repair our own planet. It's very challenging. The reason, the reason I say that is because there's so much that we, that humanity itself has gained from space exploration and from space development technologies overall that have come back and provided value to Earth as well, that it's impossible to sort of think of them as being in competition with one another. So 
like what I do at Icon, for example, is I focus primarily on terrestrial 3D printing. So like how we introduce, how we design and build 3D printed structures that people can live in in the short term. And our focus in, for, in particular is on social and accessible housing for those who need it most, as well as disaster relief housing. So even though we have this long-term interest to deploy our technologies on the surface of the moon, and we have a long-term interest to deploy our technologies on the surface of Mars and introduce basically systems that can, that can deliver habitats and other types of infrastructure in the short term, we're looking at how that same, those same hardware and robotics uh, elements can be deployed and introduced here on earth to provide good for people who need it. So I see a lot of the progress and research and development that goes into things like space medicine, uh, devices, air waste, water remediation, etc. All of that technology that's developed for space also comes back and provides value to earth. Um, materials development, you know, like fire retardant materials, LEDs, GPS, there's a whole bunch of technologies that you don't associate with being, having been developed for space, and yet they were initially, right? So I see there being a lot of kind of mutually informed benefit in thinking about how we can not only introduce technologies for space, but how they can be, they can come back and provide value for Earth too. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Next question is by Alma. Yes, hello there. Um, I wanted to ask, is it possible to use a regular to 3D print it as a construction element and not only as a radiation shield as, as it, is, it is seen quite often today? And mostly because um, is it possible to pressurize it from the inside? And what is that exact mixture that is used? Oh, that's a great question. If your question is about pressurization, I don't think that regolith alone can, can uh, I don't think we have enough evidence to suggest that regolith alone would be able to create a pressure boundary that uh, can withstand the forces of internal pressurization alone. I think there would need to be some kind of material layup, whether it be a secondary material layer, fabric, et cetera, that can actually withstand the flexural forces for pressurization. Uh, regolith is not well suited towards that. So, you know, like in the lantern concept, we introduced the tension cables um, and, and the fabric liner. I think that there would need to be in the future multi-material printing strategies so that we can introduce a, a way of, of, of actually achieving internal pressurization that doesn't rely on regolith alone. Mm -hmm. And what would be the binder? As on Mars would be sulfur, but on moon, sulfur would um, actually melt. Um, but do you know, is it maybe, I've heard of magnesium as a binder for the 3D printed regolith on moon. Do you have any more information about that? Sulfur is an interesting kind of approach. Yes, there are some, there's some weight, I, I guess you can say there's some like material like formulations that incorporate sulfur as a substitute to incorporating water. So you don't have to introduce hydration. Um, mm -hmm. Do I have a favorite kind of material additive <laughs> necessarily? No, but at the same time, I think that um, whatever we choose is going to have to be very thermally resistant. It's thermally resilient. I think that's one of the main things for us to sort of consider. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really as much as I can say right now. Thank you very much. Yeah. You. Um, we can all see that we have different levels of questions for Melody. So the next question is by Fabian, and it, he says it's a more general question, but I think an important question for us architects. Fabian, please. Um, yes, you already partially answered um, the question before on Marcel's question. It was 
Um, what are the conclusions that can be drawn from the difficult building conditions on the moon, which can be helpful for building on Earth? Some of the conclusions. This is, I love this question. Um, I really think that there's there's a lot. It's it's kind of a new thing in the last I think decade or so that building information modeling and construction and uh, AEC architecture engineering construction kind of workflows are being thought about in terms of how they can provide value for thinking about the construction of surface structures for the moon and Mars. It's an, it's a new kind of idea to think about how we can digitally design these structures and introduce ways of integrating with other elements, whether they be, you know, pre-integrated components such as airlocks, um, MEP, uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing uh, systems, and how we have to bring them all together into like a single home, whole home uh, performative structure that can function on the surface of the moon or frankly, even on earth. Like, we have to recognize that when we're talking about 3D printed construction, we're talking about a single material that's being used, usually a single material that is being used to conduct, to construct what is primarily the structure of a habitat or a house. It is not a fully functioning habitat or house just yet. Like in the work that we do at ICON, we still have to coordinate with other trades. We're responsible for the wall assembly, the design and the construction of the wall assembly, including its reinforcement, including the interface of the wall to the foundation, the wall to the roof. And yet all of that coordination and all of that finish out and everything that actually goes into creating a fully functional home still happens using you know, traditional construction means and methods. So you still need to install your lighting. You still need to install your plumbing. Um, the same goes for construction on other planets. 3D printing is only one component of what it's going to mean to create a fully functional and operational space environment for astronauts and for crew. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question is by Topias. Um, my question was, what's the time horizon for this project? Because I was wondering the uh, progress in the development of these technologies is happening very fast. And you mentioned that there is, uh, this is planned for short-term stays and also long-term stays in the future. And I was wondering what's the horizon? When do you think there will be um, long-term stays on the moon? Oh, okay, let me, yeah, it's a great question. Let me separate my answer into two parts. One, which is sort of me speaking on behalf of the hardware and robotics development that we're doing at ICON and one that is like me personally in terms of my enthusiasm for settling and sort of developing base infrastructure on the moon. Um, the space architecture work and the schematic design work that was put together for Project Olympus represents an initial way to sort of derive hardware, dev hardware requirements for what we need to build in terms of a 3D printing system. It doesn't necessarily indicate that this is precisely the path that we're going to go down. It was used as a way of formulating the constraints for what it is that we need to build in terms of our printer. Like we need to be able to deliver a habitat of a certain size. We need to be able to deliver a landing pad of a certain size. So there was this mutually reinforcing kind of exchange between what was happening on the design side and then why it was happening on the engineering side in terms of like, what are the hardware capabilities that we need to demonstrate? So within the next decade, as part of the impact program, the idea is to deploy in a demo mission, as it's being called, capabilities to show horizontal construction on the surface of the moon within the next decade. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, as far as what, in terms of like me and projecting into the future of when I think that there's going to be 3D printed 
uh, structures on the moon. Well, I, I don't think it's going to happen within the next decade, but I'm very hopeful that there are going to be other surface construction types that will be uh, deployed first, you know, for just like hard, hard shell and inflatable structures. And over time, we'll work towards uh, demonstrating capabilities that can enable pressurized structures to actually be, be there as well. But I think it's going to take quite a bit of time. There's quite a bit more that we need to validate, uh, you know, in terms of like multi-material printing, in terms of outfitting, in terms of foundation design, in terms of, yeah, I mean, in terms of everything, it's still a very, very early stage technology when it comes to deployment on the moon and in terms of like, you know, how we design for the environmental conditions of the moon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have the next question by Flora. So um, I was thinking of if you do this habitat, or plan this habitat for the future. What kind of crew members do you think you are going to send on the moon? Like, like are they just going to try to survive? Are they just engineers or are they also scientists? This is, I love this question. I think that like these rec recent missions like inspiration for in some of the, in, in some of the commercial based, uh, the commercial based companies that have been introducing civilian astronauts, you know, for these short term missions and flights has really opened up new possibilities in terms of future crew members and, and what we're, what we should be able to anticipate. Um, so it's, it's very exciting to think that like we're breaking away from the paradigm of the so-called NASA astronaut, like trained NASA astronaut. And um, yeah, I do think in the future that we're going to be seeing more civilian based crews with greater diversity, uh, which is very important and greater types of perspectives and expertise. Uh, almost certainly we will I, I think one of the main reasons why we need to go to the moon is to do geological science and geological and planetary based science. So almost certainly we can anticipate uh, some science expertise in regards to that. Like it's one of the reasons why it makes so much more sense to have people exploring there rather than just focusing on robotic rovers. Um, but yeah, I, I do look forward to a future in which there is more diversity and inclusion when it comes to astronaut crews. Thank you. Next question is by Stefan. Yeah, hello. <laughs> First of all, thanks for the amazing presentation. And my question, uh, how long does uh, the material that is used for the 3D, uh, 3D printing last and how does the maintenance looks like? Like there are other circumstances on the moon? How long does it last? Um, I don't think we've really looked at, we haven't really looked at like the longevity of the material in terms of small samples. We've only looked at like holistic validation of the structure from a kind of like structural design, finite element analysis perspective. We haven't really gone into things like material degradation and and whatnot. It's a, it's a complex problem. Um, yeah, and it's something that like for the terrestrial work at ICON, we're very invested in because we have direct consumers that, that, <laughs> that want to ensure that their homes are going to be beautiful for years and decades to come. But it's not something that we, we've been focusing, the focus and the emphasis has been more on holistic structural design rather than like material degradation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question by Katarina. Yeah, I have uh, like a basic question, like how's um, the energy management going to be like, it's even on earth, like to be resource effic efficiency is like really um, a big thing. And I did see like you have like a fuel um, storage and stuff, but 
is your goal also to be like self-sufficient in the future? And um, does the 3D printer also works with fuel or are you going to for solar energy? Um, what is the plan for that? Almost certainly there are going to have to be, and this is my own personal opinion, there are going to be, have to be multiple redundant energy and power sources on the surface of the moon that are leveraged not only for the construction system, which is what Olympus is, but also for other elements such as, you know, like ensuring the pressurization of your habitats and other kind of surface infrastructure. Um, we need to rely on other power resources. It's not something and a capability that we're developing ourselves. So for the initial demo missions, we are looking towards a lander or another power resource that we can connect and integrate with to actually do our work. But um, yes, I think almost certainly in the long term, we're going to have to rely on solar. We're going to have to rely on uh, other types of power and resources for, for this type of work to happen. Thank you. Um, yes, this is an interesting question by Franziska. Yes, um, I'm a complete newbie to space architecture, so sorry for my very primitive question. Yeah. <laughs> but everything I see from the moon and also in the projects you showed us and especially the lunar lantern, it's the horizontal structures and the vertical structures, they're all circular shaped or round shaped. Why is this the go-to shape on the moon? <laughs> and uh, Because the most things we build on the earth, they are like a rectangular shape and they have edges. And why isn't this the case on the moon? I love this question because it's so, it, you're right. It's so foundational and yet, it also represents to me the real design possibility of designing for space, but also designing for 3D printing, which is so exciting. So construction materials on earth overall, like to grossly generalized are manufactured to be flat packed and transported. There's no use in having materials that just sit within a factory. They need to be transported to the site. They need to be integrated with other elements and assembled in a way that makes the most sense. So by and large, we have been biased towards rectilinear flat pack uh, materials and surfaces when it comes to terrestrial construction. Um, the load cases, to use a kind of like structural engineering phrase, the load cases that we have to design for, for terrestrial construction and architecture are, are based off of earth gravity, right? So we're, we don't have to contain an environment for people to breathe, that's foundational, right? Um, and essentially like we only have to, primarily have to design for earth-based gravity as well as seismic conditions. In space, if we want to create a breathable environment for astronauts and other crew members to live within like a shirt sleeve, env shirt sleeve environment, without a, sp a space suit, we need to contain an atmosphere within the general environment so that there's air to breathe and so that the, the environmental kind of, let's just say that the temperature is appropriate for actually just like living within and, um, and, and to make sure that it's a protective environment as well. That said, because uh, in, in orbit, because we have, essentially we're in a vacuum, and then on the surface of the moon and on the surface of Mars, maintaining interior pressurization uh, leads towards the development of pressure vessels and pressure membranes that resemble balloons and other kind of uh, internally pressurized structures that you would see in some instances on Earth. So the bias, typically speaking, from a kind of form factor or geometric perspective is towards those forms that are very well suited towards maintaining interior pressurization. So this is why we see in large part spheres, toruses, cylinders, 
and these other kinds of very primitive pressure vessels as being primary sort of uh, geometries for architectural construction in space. It's very well suited towards interior pressurization. We, we alluded to this earlier, regolith is not a good material for, uh, for, for, for resisting um, interior, for resisting tensile forces. So it's not, it works primarily in compression just based off of you know, its properties and it doesn't work very well in tension. So fabrics and other kind of materials that are better suited towards pressure vessel construction uh, are actually better suited at, at actually achieving those geometries and building those geometries. And part of the challenge for 3D printed construction in space is how to introduce sufficient tensile capacity so that we can create those structures and geometries. Does that very make sense? Very interesting, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question and for the answer, Melody. Uh, we have maybe a similar one or one that suits to this answer by Alspetta. Yes, yes, hello. Thank you for the presentation, first of all. I am also a new, this is a new field for me. Uh, so I am discovering so much new stuff. And um, my question was if uh, in the designing process, if you also consider the architectural aesthetics or if uh, all the beautiful shapes uh, are made by its um, function primarily? I love this question. Um, I have a bias. <laughs> My bias is that aesthetics should also go hand in hand and present simultaneous benefit in terms of human factors. And what I would say is the success from a kind of performance criteria of the interior experience of the space habitat. So I don't necessarily subscribe to formal ideation that does not directly deliver or respond to the experience of the crew and the performance of the crew within a space environment. Um, I think that from a structural and engineering and even architectural perspective that we have to be, that I think, uh, design approaches should be synthesizing environmental and engineering constraints as best as possible mm -hmm. and use those and leverage those constraints as an opportunity for formal investigation and not the other way around, mm -hmm. not having aesthetics dictate what are base principles when it comes to structural engineering. That's my approach. I know that some designers might approach it differently, even you know, within teams I've collaborated in. But uh, that's the way that I have found that we can introduce mutual benefit, both from you know, a structural engineering and engineering and kind of, I guess you could say, uh, aerospace-based perspective, but also an architectural and sort of design-based perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question by Flora. Um, I have a personal question. So if your um, project will be realized and you're still alive <laughs> in the future, <laughs> um, yeah. would, you be one, would you like to be one of the crew members on the moon? Like one of the first person on the moon and because you're already specialized and are an expert in this and would you be one of them oh i don't know if i'm an expert but it's definitely an area that i'm really really passionate about um i would go to the moon in a heartbeat i think it would be amazing absolutely but if you were to tell me like that i would be on a like a first The first mission to Mars, like on a pioneering mission to Mars, I would think twice. It's a big commitment, very risky. There's so much we don't know. There's so much that they like is still just unknown. And yeah, but when it comes to like a short stay on the moon or like a visit to the moon, I absolutely, I think it would be wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> 
Melody, thanks for your honest answer concerning a mass mission. <laughs> yeah. I don't oh. know about that. I actually really like <laughs> my life here. Yeah, I thought so too. I was you always asked by many people, you know, would you go to Mars? And I'm also I'm always wondering about the people that say yes, sure. Hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, next question, it may be a tricky one because Mark Cohen is here. He asked a question via YouTube and I invited him to the Zoom meeting. Mark, hello. I, I would like to introduce Mark shortly to the students and especially to the Abu Dhabi students because Mark was the founder or a co-founder of the Space Architecture Technical Committee and this uh, professional um, collaboration. Mark is also someone whose paper I have always appreciated and um, the students from the ADU know already some of your papers because I'm um, proposing them to read. So Mark, I'm letting Mark ask you a few questions now, Melody. Okay. They will be very critical, I'm sure, because Mark is a very critical person. Uh, well, okay. uh, thank you for the introduction, but I, I think you're exaggerating. First of all, I, I want to uh, compliment you, Melody, on an excellent project and superb presentation. I'm, I'm very proud of you. Um, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. It was very much a group effort. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to ask you uh, first, what region of the moon do you envision as the location for the lo this lunar base? And are you considering the permanently shadowed regions on the South Pole? South Pole almost exclusively was the area that we were taking a look at and that we looked at with the lunar reconnaissance orbiter maps. We didn't, we didn't look at any other areas. Uh, the permanently shattered regions are interesting. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily that I could. So like we looked at a couple of loading, thermal loading conditions where your habitat would be partially within the light and partially within dark. And it introduces very, very severe structural stresses. Um, and so there's something very appealing about designing for, you know, permanently shattered areas. And yeah, it introduces some, some challenges when it comes to like, I don't know, how do you integrate with other energy, re energy resources that would need to be in permanent sunlight or would more likely be in permanently lit regions? So lots of challenges. I don't think I have a good answer right now. Okay, so um, there is one detail that intrigues me. Uh, can you please elaborate on what I think you call the 12 inch isolated pendulums? Yes, so this was a concept. This is a basically a, a base isolation concept for dampening uh, seismic lateral movement due to seismic activity moonquakes. So the idea was that we would introduce these friction-based pendulums that would be installed prior to the structure being printed and use that as a way of dampening, of, of enabling the structure to be decoupled from the ground during seismic events so that we can dampen some of the material stresses that would result from seismic activity. So these are installed in the foundation or below the foundation? Above, above the foundation, above like the right foundation. beneath the structure. It's something nice. that's incorporated like in Japan and many structures, in California and many structures. Um, and it's again, a way of decoupling the movement of, of the ground from, uh, from, from the structure itself. Right, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with it. In, in fact- oh, you're the, in California, yeah. Right, yeah, in fact, I watched the construction of the uh, the new two billion dollars Stanford Medical Center, which the whole structure sits on one, basically one pendulum that slides across its base, across a steel surface at its base. So yeah, I understand that. And also, 
the city corp building has a uh, has basically a wind dampener up at the top under the uh, under the 45 degree roof mm-hmm. um, yeah so I, I see what you're doing all right uh, so another question can you please explain the geometry of the post tensioning cables within the regolith habitat shell the geometry well essentially like where do you place them they would we envisioned that they would be deployed from the top of a pre-integrated core which would be manufactured out of metal and, and integrated on earth and launched from earth as a kind of pre-integrated element and the cables would be uh, in spools at the top of that of that structure and they would deploy downwards and they could be fastened at the bottom of the structure. So basically creating a sort of cage around the shell itself. We were sort of arguing whether the cables should deploy from the base of the structure and be installed at the top or whether they should deploy as spools from the top and then be fastened below. And that was the that was basically what we ended up with. So, so then they run down through the 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 shell itself. We there could we didn't I didn't show this as a detail, but some of some of what we iterated on was that there would be basically divots within the printed structure itself that could act as a kind of channel for those tension cables to actually sit within. Right. So you'd have to put tubing within the regolith shell. Or it would just be part of the printed geometry. Like the tool path of the 3D printer could create those divots layer by layer. I see. I'm saying divots, I mean channels. Like it's part of the geometry of the printed printed structure. Okay, all right, I get that. And then finally, um, the dis- concern, my question concerns the distancing of the landing paths from the habitats based upon possible crash landing failure on or near the pad. What distance do you anticipate between the habitat and the landing pads? Several, several kilometers. I don't really, I haven't thought about crash landings. I don't think many people have. I think we try to, we try to, we try and avoid those types of failures as best as oh, we try to avoid thinking about those types of failures as much as possible. But um, yes, many, many kilometers. Okay, that's, that's good. I mean, uh, yeah, of course, crash landings may happen. But at the same time, I think it's good to think optimistically and think that we're going to be uh, reducing the risk as best as we can based off of what we know and what we think the performance of these systems should actually be. Right, well, um, yeah, optimism is wonderful till you lose a crew. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so uh, you you don't wanna wipe out your habitat at the same time. No, yeah, many, many kilometers away is what um is what i would say at the same time like yeah cargo offloading is going to be a logistics problem for for us to be thinking about and uh certainly like i it's it's hard to sort of think about like what is the what kind of roadways do we want to actually design and and, and what are those safety keep out zones that I spoke about earlier, as well as program adjacencies, but uh, many, many kilometers away. I think that's one of the primary sort of goals in thinking about where to locate habitats in relation to landing pads. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark, for joining. I hope we have the pleasure to have you also soon in our talk. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, We have another question by Lisa, please. Well, I think this was also already partially answered. Um, I was just curious because nuclear power system was coming up again. And I feel like we already, or at least in Europe, kind of have 
demolished those mostly or just not using them anymore. So like with the problems who kind of already we got rid of on earth, is there like a new research beginning to develop that you would use them on the moon or why is nuclear energy, for example, coming up again? And then also um, back to, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't think we would ever rely on nuclear power exclusively. I think the important thing here is that we need to be thinking about multiple redundant energy resources, such as solar, fuel cell generation, um, and, and basically leverage all of those to ensure that we have the right power needed to, for, for our systems to function as they should. But I can't like speak towards, <laughs> I can't speak towards nuclear specifically. I know that it's an area that many are looking into, but I do think that like, we certainly can't just rely on one energy or power resource alone. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Melody. Uh, we have one question by, I hope I spell it right, Marina Capran. Um, one more great question about materials. Um, have you used regolith or just concrete uh, while uh, building this prototype? This, uh, in that case, you have shown in the video in the end. <laughs> oh, uh, great question. So for the landing pad prototype that we did the hot fire test, we were using the Icon Lavacrete material, which is a mortar-based cement material. It is not using lunar regolith simulant, but for our uh, current and ongoing uh, prototyping efforts for Olympus, we're working with a variety of lunar simulants, just not at the scale of that landing pad. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, because I, I wonder how close it uh was to the real ch future challenges and yeah thank you i mean in the future we also need to be prototyping within a vacuum right and we also need to be doing destructive testing within a vacuum it's it's challenging and it's exciting to think about you know like the multiple levels of prototyping that are involved but the landing pad demo and the hot fire test was I would say represents a demonstration at scale for our kind of, I guess you could say, uh, command and control mechanisms, our sort of print path deposition system using the current Vulcan printer and how we can sort of adapt those in the future for other designs for landing pads. Thank you. We have another question by Marius. And I think, Melody, we have 15 minutes left, right? Yes. Okay, wonderful. We have so many questions. What a good start for the module. Thank you for this talk. Marius, please. Um, I just I was just uh, wondering if, uh, if the high temperature difference uh, was considered as something good because um, for example, you can uh, use this uh, temperature difference to generate uh, power. For example, if you have materials that compress uh, and uh, decompress at temperature, you could uh, generate power and use it in a case of a blackout. But uh, more than that, I was wondering if, uh, in general, if this temperature difference was uh, uh, seen as an opportunity, not, not as a problem at all. Yeah. So the problem that I see is when you have a structure that's asymmetrically thermally loaded, like part of the structure is in the shade and part of it is in the sun, it introduces some really, really problematic stress states to your structure. And it can lead to cracking, material fatigue, puncturing, like a whole bunch of stuff that you don't want to think about when you're working and building a regolith. 
that's the problem that I see is when you have those asymmetrical thermal loads. Um, but other than that, I think it's interesting to think about like, of course, there's so much potential for accumulating solar energy when you're in the permanently lit peaks of eternal light area of regions of the moon. And then conversely, like in the same way that Mark was suggesting, like what if we exclusively design to be in the permanently shadowed regions? What does that mean? So I think each presents a kind of different opportunity and each presents a different sort of uh, risk profile, but also like different uh, requirements that you would need to engineer your structure. I don't have a good answer for what would be the most appropriate way to move forward. Um, I think we also have to respond to the landing sites that were given and for, in large part for the work that was done for Olympus, the approach was to be as site agnostic as possible because our focus is on the construction system really and on the products that we actually deliver using the construction system. I, it's, it's hard to say whether we can design specifically for a certain site or a certain condition on the moon. I hope we will, but it's hard to say. Thank you. Next question by Trinka, Ilian. Hello, hi. Um, I actually have uh, three questions, but I'm going to jump to the third one because uh, the first one, I think you already covered that. This was regarding MVP implementation uh, to the 3D printed structure. And the second one, I think, is self-explaining regarding sustain uh, sustainability. But uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned something regarding uh, civilian-based crews, that, you, that it is a possibility to, to have the civilians up on Mars or on, on the moon. But um, does it, uh, or, or did you also consider some sort of healthcare concept? Because if you have civilians there, they make it sick. So for them, you might need uh, some sort of medical treatment. If you're just talking about the astronauts, I know they have a special training so they can take care of themselves. But uh, if you have civilians there, they might need some, I don't know, yeah, medical treatment. Therefore, you have uh, the need to, to, to have some, I don't know, medical equipment. And some of those are really heavy. And also the technical requirements for those medical equipments, it's also to be considered. So. Is this or has this ever been considered like some sort of healthcare medical concept for, for Mars or, or for the moon? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a really, really great, great question. So in all of the, in, in both this habitat concept as well as some others that I've worked on, there's always been some sort of medical bay or medical station where, um, where that type of work can be done, it's, it's of huge importance to the crew to have medical capabilities and have the capability to self-examine, self-diagnose, and then treat one another um, should, should someone become very ill. I worked on a Trish grant. Trish is the Translational Research Institute for Space Help uh, I, some years ago. And it looked at, you know, in the future, if you, for example, and I don't think this is necessarily going to be the case because the exploration medical capabilities element at NASA is very adamant that there must be at least one, what we would call like crew, crew doctor or flight surgeon available with as part of any crew. Um, but in the future, if should that not be the case with commercial crews, um, we have to be thinking about how the crew can have these capabilities to self-treat, self-diagnose and, and uh, help one another in the future. But as far as any NASA mission is concerned, I'm fairly confident that there will be at minimum one, if not multiple flight surgeons aboard. Uh, but yes, it's a very good point. In terms of habitat construction, you certainly need medical capabilities in an area to to treat and, and, uh, and maintain sick and ill crew members on, uh, over the course of you know, your mission. And that, that's, it's the same for in orbit or on the surface of any planet. 
But uh, then again, also, we will have to, to, to develop some, some lighter medical equipments because, for example, if you need a, a X-ray or I don't know if, it, if you have like diff more difficult diseases uh, where you need to fight uh, cancer and you need some cyclotrons or I don't know, some, some proton therapy, those are equipments that nowadays on Earth, they are super, super heavy. You need, um, I don't know, some, some yeah. Uh, trucks and I don't know what to 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 deliver those and uh, cranes to put them inside the buildings and stuff like that. And um, if if the if the transportation nowadays it's it it's it's difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, I fully agree with you. It's I think that in space medical treatment is a little bit biased to focusing on immediate and acute sicknesses. Because our only precedent right now is the International Space Station. And if somebody becomes very, very ill aboard Space Station, you can evacuate and bring them back home, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. For a Mars mission, you don't have that as a possibility. So it introduces a whole bunch of other risk factors. And I don't think we're at the point yet where we can necessarily be thinking about how to treat against cancer in space because it's just such a task in and of itself to even uh, identify the risk profile of cancer in space to begin with. Yeah. Like even that modeling effort takes so much and uh, we have so much more to learn, you know? So yeah, the ISS represents the state of the art when it comes to space medicine. And there's so much more that we have to, to sort of wrap our heads around before we can even consider what these other types of long durations missions are going to ask us. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. I think we are at the last question and I have to choose now. Um, I'm, I'm choosing an Erasmus student. Yisu Han, I'm sure it's not right. Please tell me. Um, Yisu, Yisu. Oh yes, I forgot oh, to open the yes. Uh, I may not familiar with the uh, physical knowledge about the moon. And I wonder if the construction of this habitation will have some uh, impact on the lunar environment because uh, it, it kind of changed the terrain of the moon to some extent. Yes. Oh, I love that question. There is a big emphasis on planetary protection and the creation of lunar heritage sites on the moon that I think is in conflict right now to some of the exploration and development initiatives that are being commercially led. Um, so I don't have a good answer, but I think it is important for us to be thinking about the longevity of the moon and planetary protection overall. I think that there's a lot for us to sort of be thinking about in terms of the rhetoric of colonization, because I think it, I find it problematic overall. I think there's a lot that we could learn from indigenous peoples in, in multiple continents on earth and speaking to them about how we work with the land and, and live on the land and what we can sort of adapt and, and, and uh, leverage for how we explore the moon and how we build on the moon in the future. And those are dialogues that need to be happening, that need to be happening as, like, as early as now, really. It's, it's such a fascinating question and it's something that I feel really strongly about too. So I'm glad you asked. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, maybe we have time for one last question, Melody. Sure. Um, let's... Who wants to have the last question? Please just move forward and ask. Okay. Okay, I can. 
Um, my question was, um, I, think, I think the link between research and architect is really interesting. And my question was, um, uh, how is going the collaboration between uh, engineering team and architect? And yes, how, we, how is going the evolution of the project? And yes. It's a great question. So initially, I mean, Icon asked for these two concepts from search and from big to be put together so that design and the aspirations of architecture could be used to inform what is done in hardware engineering. And, but at the same time, it wasn't like design and architecture was happening in isolation. It wasn't the work, the work that we were doing as designers and architects was not happening in isolation. We were learning and leveraging and working with the constraints of the technology and what we knew was going to be, you know, basically a, a, a fact about a additive construction on the moon as a constraint to inform the design. So it's this mutually reinforcing kind of relationship where one inspires the other, one acts as a constraint to the other. And uh, that was really like a very, very productive and, and I think positive collaboration on that was, that was initiated by ICON to move things forward and and, and introduce a very fortunate kind of opportunity to engage these ideas in a very free way. Uh, the reality of architecture practice and even design for space is that you're normally, I would say almost always, working against timeline, budget, and schedules that don't enable that kind of free thinking and don't enable ideas to be fleshed out to their full capacity. And yet this was one chance that I feel really grateful for, you know, where we were encouraged to think that way. We were encouraged to really push it all the way and show what um, every possible kind of iteration and ramification of the design could be ranging from the landing pad to the habitat. So that's what I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're on mute, Sandra. I'm muted, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lali, for this great concluding question. Thank you, Melody, for your fantastic input and for your patience, for answering all the different questions. I think it was a really great talk. Thank you a lot. And a good start for the module. Amazing. I'm so happy. I hope this was helpful and interesting to you all. It was really interesting to hear your questions. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Great. Bye. Bye. Best Thank of luck. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.